good afternoon good morning friends wherever you are depending on uh, the location and part of the world uh, welcome to this uh, lecture series uh, on 15th anniversary of the theory of justice by john rawls uh, in today's uh, session uh, we are going to look at how rawlsian ideas are revised by a quite well known but not so much known in the social science field by paul ricker uh, among us we have uh, the speaker professor kurivilla pandikat um, who is the dean of school of uh, philosophy at nyanapeet nyanapeet vidya uh, vidyapeet in pune his interest is primarily in the intersection of physics and the religion and he also uh, has done his phd on the works of ricker and then, therefore we have the right person to speak to us today about how rawlsian movement to ricker has uh, taken place uh, professor kurvela uh, has agreed to take few questions after he makes his uh, uh, preliminary exposition so by the first few 30 minutes or so professor kurvela will speak to us and then we will uh, take a break to move on to question answer session and um, so over to uh, 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 professor so welcome to all of you and first of all i want to thank professor soni and the institute for giving me this opportunity to share something on roles john rawls and the critique and their praise appreciation by rick paul rick let me start by sharing the screen Uh, i suppose it is clear to you john rawls was born as you know 100 years ago and his book the most prestigious book book the magnum opus was written in 1971 so this gives us a chance an opportunity to reflect on justice as fairness and how we live out this justice in today's world most of you would be knowing quite a lot on roles so the first part that deals with roles i'll be skip skipping fast but i want to dwell on a couple of experiences of john rawls as child you may have already known this but rawls as a child experienced two tragic incidences the death of two of his own brothers and that also caused indirectly by rawls own sickness they contracted fatal illness from rawls in 1928 the 7 year old rawls contracted diphtheria his brother bobby young just by 20 months visited him in his room and unfortunately died the next winter rawls contracted pneumonia and another younger brother of his tommy caught the illness from him and died loss of these two brothers according to the historian of john rawls is the most important event in john's childhood during his last two years in princeton rawls was very much interested and involved in religious experiences and 
He was deeply concerned with theology and its many doctrines. And after his early studies in Princeton, he thought of, but he didn't attend a seminary, a religious school so that he could become an Episcopal priesthood. And as he was writing his paper, he wrote a very, very serious and intensely religious thesis. And the thesis is entitled 181 pages, and it is entitled Meaning, Sin, and Faith. Towards the end of my presentation, I will just reflect on these three themes, meaning, sin, and faith. And in this thesis, he attacked Pelagianism. We will see what it is later. And he drew quite much from Karl Marx's famous book or booklet on the Jewish question. And this booklet is a very small one, criticized the idea that natural inability, natural inequality, inability could be a just determiner of the distribution of wealth in the society. So the inequality in nature does not justify the distribution of wealth. So justice as fairness has its seeds in this thesis itself. And another thing on the Jewish question, he raises this question. What is the basis of profane Judaism? He's not very much keen. This is Karl Marx talking. Karl Marx is definitely not talking about the religious Judaism. That is not what he wants. But what is the basis of profane Judaism? And he would say, Marx would say, it is self-interest. And what is the worldly cult of Judaism, Judaism as a religion? That is pastoring. You bargain, you somehow sell your product. And what is this worldly God? The Judaic God, you know, is very different from a profane interpretation of that. And that Judaic God is money. So in the final, final analysis, Marx would say, the emancipation of the Jews is the emancipation of mankind from Judaism, from the religious Judaism. And Karl Marx will go on. This is not an isolated instance. The Jew has emancipated himself in a Jewish matter, manner, not only by acquiring the power of money, but also because money has become through him and also apart from him, a world power, while the practical Jewish spirit has become the practical spirit of the Christian nations. So Judaism and its spirit has conquered the world through the Christian nations. The Jews have emancipated themselves in so far as the Christians have become Jews. They have taken over its spirit and consider money as their God. So, again quoting from Karl Marx, money is the jealous God of Israel, beside which no other God may exist. Money abases all the gods of mankind and changes them into commodities. Money is the universal and self-sufficient value of all things. It has therefore deprived the whole world, both the human world and nature, of their own proper value. Money is the alienated essence of man's work and existence. And this existence, this essence dominates him and he worships it. Again, this is Marx. Every creature should be transformed into property according to capitalism and according to the Jewish heritage. 
the fishes in the water, the birds of the air, the plants of the earth. And this calls for objectification, leading to the practice of alienation. Just as man, so long as he is engrossed in religion, can only objectify his essence by an alien and fantastic being, God. So, under the sway of egoistic need, he can only affirm himself and produce objects in practice by subordinating his products and his own activity to the dominion of an alien entity and by attributing to them the significance of an alien entity, that is money. So money has become God. Money has alienated human beings and human beings worship money in its various forms. Even after Rhodes became an, an atheist, many of the anti-Pelagian arguments he used were repeated in the theory of justice. Pelagius was a British ascetic who lived in the fifth century. He was, and Pelagianism is the cult, the sect that grew out of Pelagius. It is a heterodox Christian theological position, which holds that the original sin did not taint human nature and that humans have the free will to achieve human perfection without divine grace. In other words, human beings are by themselves good, by themselves they are capable of growth. The original sin has not tainted the whole human nature. That is Pelagianism and Rawls is against it just as Rawls absorbed quite a lot of ideas from the Jewish question. Let us take the, some of the basic principles of this Pelagian controversy. One, God commands something impossible. Adam was created mortal. Adam's sin injured only Adam and it did not carry on. Some people are saved by law and infant baptism, that is baptizing a child is not for the forgiveness of sins and human nature is indestructibly good. The basic goodness of human nature. Human beings can resist sin easily. All are created as Adam before the fall. Adam and Eve committed sin. That does not mean that we are also now partakers of that same sin. There is grace freely given. And this grace given by God facilitates goodness. And this grace is illumination and instruction. It is enlightenment. And grace is given by God based on our merit. Christianity makes sinlessness easier because we are given by, we are graced by God because it is easy for us to become like God, to become good. Christianity makes sinlessness easier. We can very well live without sin. And Jesus Christ is the greatest example of a sinless life. And we human beings are totally free. So these are some of the Pelagian controversies which Rawls does not approve of. Okay, in this context, these two contexts of uh, Pelagianism and Karl Marx, Jewish question, let us come to Rawls' magnum opus, The Theory of Justice. I know that most of you are aware of it, so I wouldn't be dwelling too much time on this particular aspect. Rawls' intent was to show that notions of freedom and equality could be integrated into a seamless unity of justice as fairness. By attempting to enhance the perspective 
which his readers should take when thinking about justice, John Rawls hoped to show that the supposed conflict between freedom and equality does not really exist. It is an illusion. So, all of us know, this book includes a thought experiment, the original position. The intuition motivating its employment is this. The whole enterprise of political philosophy will be greatly benefited by the specification of the correct standpoint a person could take in her thinking about justice. When we think about what it would mean for a just state of affairs to obtain between persons, we eliminate certain few features like the hair or the eye color, the height, etc., and fixate upon others which are common. So Rawls, this original position is to meant to encode all of our intuitions about which features about a just society is relevant and which are not relevant for the purpose of deliberating on justice. And this hypothetical scenario leads to a veil of ignorance. Because this veil of ignorance, there will be a fairer way of approaching our status in the society. Because we don't know which of the specific roles we will be taking in the real world, from this veil of ignorance, we would be able to appreciate both justice and fairness better. So, the principles of justice are best derived from a hypothetical contract carried out in original position of equality behind the veil of ignorance. And they are chosen by every individual if each individual were in a so-called original position of equality with respect to both the rights and duties and where all the individuals who are acting rationally in a mutually disinterested manner. So this is the basic position, the hypothetical situation. Then we have each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty for others. The two basic principles, the principle of liberty and the second one, social and economic inequalities, they would be there but they are to be arranged in such a way that the least advantaged stand to benefit. That is the difference principle and fair equality of opportunity principle. So to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged and attached to offices and positions which are open to all under conditions of fair equality and opportunity. But the first principle obviously stands apart, that of the basic liberty granted to every citizen. So, justice in the original position, I'm summing up and repeating, the individuals concerned are not aware of their place in the society, their class position or social status. That is the original position. They do not know their fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities in the actual society they would be living in. Third, they're also unaware of their natural assets and abilities, the talents, the intelligence, the strengths and their weakness. They also do not know their conception of the goods or their special psychological propensities. So if they don't know these, then you have the veil of ignorance, which will help you choose the best of the possible societies. Therefore, no one is advantaged or disadvantaged 
in the choice of principles by the outcome of the natural chance or the contingency of the social circumstances. And according to him, the people of the society, society come together and make a constitution, social contract theory of Rousseau and others, in which these principles of justice, these principles of justice are incorporated and then legislators should be made to enact laws which are in conformity of the principles initially agreed upon. Now, how do we realize this? The procedure of realization. It is said that there should be a proper institutional setup after which the market should be brought into the picture, which in turn decides the distribution patterns of the commodities. The market and the commodities within a proper institutional setup. The proper institutional setup here means the basic liberties that are provided to each one, especially as referred to in the first principle. And then Rawls will agree that rationality is definitely a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for moral choice between human beings, especially when they have to make up a choice. This theory of frauds goes totally against the utilitarian principle because utilitarianism tried to justify the infringement upon the rights of some individuals if these infringements produce the greater happiness, the greatest happiness of a large number, Mill, Stuart, and so on. And another major defect of utilitarianism, according to Rawls, is that the principle of utility, usefulness, or pragmatism may require that individuals who are disadvantaged in relation to others in their ability to attain primary social goods may have to suffer even greater advantage. So those that are disadvantaged may be forced to suffer even more. So it is here that Rawls ushers in this concept of justice as fairness. The theory of justice as fairness argues for equal rights for all individuals and denies that injustice towards any particular group of individuals is justifiable unless this justice is necessary to prevent an even greater injustice. So, a limited injustice is tolerated only if it, its absence will lead to even greater injustice. Although Rawls talks about justice and fairness, he also distinguishes between the two. They are not identical. But he agrees that the principles of justice are agreed to only under fair conditions by individuals who are in a situation of equality. Justice as fairness also implies that the principles of justice apply equally to all individuals, both the marginalized and the others. Rawls explained equal distribution of incoming wealth as a justice principle, equal distribution of incoming wealth to each individual. But at the same time, it was realized that we can do much better even for those who are unlucky or those who are marginalized. As it is not necessary that all people may be lucky to have been born rich or been rich, healthy or wealthy, so a better approach of different principle was introduced by Rawls, the maxi mini principle also. In this context, I would like to make an application based on Lydia Kerketa's article where she has compared Rawls with Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen. She says, the two principles of justice as preferred by Rawls seems to completely fit in 
with the Indian constitution. It may be that Rawls got influenced by the Indian constitution and the way in which various fundamental rights of the constitution have been interpreted by the Supreme Court of India in the latter stages seems to reflect the idea of Rawls, especially the interpretations of articles 14, 15, 16, 21, etc. This is taken from the article by Lydia Kerketa. Okay, Lydia observes, the first principles of justice as propounded by Rawls has its influence on the interpretation of Article 14 as Justice Chandrachur observed. Justice Chandrachur says, the underlying principles of the guarantee of Article 14 that all persons similarly circumstanced should be treated alike both in privileges conferred and liabilities imposed. And then the second principle of justice as recommended by John Rawls is clearly reflected in the Mandel case where social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are to be of the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of the society, similar to the difference principle. Offers and positions must be open to everyone under conditions of fair equality and opportunity. The second part of the second principle. Okay, in general, some criticism against roles is that the basic principles of roles are neither dynamic nor evolutionary, nor do they take into account the un uncertainty or evaluation of chances. Chances and possibilities, there are quite much of uncertainty. And it is difficult to know when these principles are being violated. And when everything is fair, it may be easy to detect the violation. But when things are not all that transparent, it is difficult to detect the violation of the principles Rawls himself has suggested. It's very hard to use them even if we accept them as correct to differentiate between the just and the unjust societies. Again, Rawls has done an extremely good job in stating what justice is, a topic difficult to define. He has brought in a new and challenging perspective on the idea of justice based on systematic economics. Owing to the fact that this theory is recent than many others, we are yet to realize and understand its full impact when we apply it to the larger society. But one thing is certain, Rawls' emphasis on dignity and respect of each individual human being, that is something which we just cannot afford to ignore. Okay, all of you know, the related book of Amartya Sen, who was also influenced by Sen, by Rawls. Okay, now, Amartya Sen's critique, I'm not going into it now. Let me come to Paul Ricoeur. Paul Ricoeur is a French philosopher, Jean Paul Gustave Ricoeur, best known for phenomenology, hermeneutics. As such, he stands in the tradition of the great philosophers like Husserl, Gadamer, Martin Heidegger, and Gabriel Marcel. I just want to introduce you to some of his basic books. He has written many, more than 28 books, but I want to introduce you to some of the basic ones. One, the first one, the symbolism of evil, the symbolism of evil. The second one, you cannot see the full thing, but it is the conflict of interpretations. The symbolism of evil and the conflict of interpretations, both are at the level of interpretation, hermeneutics. You look at evil, how do you interpret them? And when you interpret, there would be different interpretations of the constitution of an article. And sometimes these interpretations could be 
conflicting with each other the conflict of interpretations then there is the role of metaphor a metaphor unlike a simile when i say you are a lion it's a metaphor when i say you are like a lion it becomes a simile paul rickers insight is when i use the word you are a lion you are saying you are a lion and you are not a lion and here you are creating new meaning when you use a metaphor then another book of his from text to action okay interpretation of text is normal interpretation of any legal document but you can also interpret human actions human actions can be diversely differently interpreted leading even to the conflict of interpretation so this is another book the from text to action paul ricker has also been not just phenomenology concerned with phenomenology freud and philosophy is an essay on interpretation but from a psychological point of view ricker has interpreted freud from a psychological and philosophical perspective time and narrative the whole question of stories this is a three volume work on the relationship between life living time being part of it and narrativity story also contributes to the meaning of life then towards the end latter part he talks he has written the book memory history forgetting this is a political book how we as individuals and a society maintain our memory our history and how we forget some of them very very conveniently he refers to the south african case of apartheid here looks at history as it evolves and how human beings can collectively find meaning in history then another book is history and truth this is a huge book running into about 600 words history memory history and forgetting and i will come to this book later history and the truth is another book then the course on recognition how we recognize and the others also how we sit when a state recognizes another state and sometimes as we know the states refuse to recognize another state so this is a political book then since i was fortunate enough to do my doctorate on paul ricker two of my books an elusive transcendence an exploration of the human condition based on paul ricker that is my book similarly another book surplus subversion submission a study on paul ricker's symbol metaphor and parable the book that we have already seen earlier then another third book of mine between beneath before and beyond an exploration of the human condition based on paul ricker so this is to introduce paul ricker to you and we'll see later how paul ricker appreciates and adds to roles can anyone actually recognize this person this is emmanuel macron the present president of france actually he was not paul uh, macron was not just a student he worked under paul ricker for two years almost like his private secretary that earlier book that 600 pages book Mem history memory and forgetting that was actually written with the help of macron and paul ricker rec acknowledges that in the introduction to the same book history memory and forgetting so 
Macron has learned quite a lot from this, our philosopher, Paul Ricoeur. Okay, he died in the year 2005. And we will see now two of Ricoeur's books specifically dealing with roles and his theory of justice, fairness. And one of his book, books is called Just the Just, the Just. And uh, the Just came in 1995. One of the criticism of Ricker against Rawls is that his basic principles and the institutional process, they are too procedural. As we already saw, it is very difficult to recognize when these procedures are violated. And then Ricker also would say, the link between the political and the moral is weak according to Rawls. The political object, the political goal is to have a just society, but the moral goal, the moral aim is to have a good society. So the link between justice and goodness that is something which Paul Ricard does not find sufficiently elaborated in a theory of justice. And Ricker takes some, both these themes in his book, The Just. So, Rawls principle of distributive justice are inadequate. The theory of primary social goods is too thin to cope appropriately with the problem of distribution. And so Ricker points out, a genuinely conflictual situation appears when digging under the pure rule of procedure, procedure, one unearths the diversity among the goods that are distributed, which the formulation of the two principles of justice tend to obliterate. So the two principles that we have seen, they don't fully uncover the procedure difficulties which Ricker refers to. Again, uh, Paul Ricker would say, Rawls gives inadequate attention to the heterogeneity of the primary goods and overlooks the historically and culturally determined character of the estimation of these goods. The primary goods, food, shelter, clothing, basic needs, they are not adequately addressed. For Ricker, the historical and cultural determination of social goods is politically important because a political philosophy constructed entirely around the theme of the heterogeneity of social goods is poorly armed to pose the problem of self-constitution of the political body along with the connected problem of self-limitation growing the lives. The second book which Ricker writes, oneself as other, myself, my subject, and how it is related to the other. So Rawls aim to identify the ideal conditions under which a universal consensus on the principles of justice may be reached. While Ricker's aim is to put the emphasis on the dialectic tension between the good and the just. So Ricker acknowledges that there is a tension between the moral goal that is the good and the political goal that is just. But we need to recognize this tension and move on from there. Indeed, with this paradoxical interpretation of Rawls' theory of justice, Ricker contributes to put the focus on the apolitical dimension of justice, on the tensional dimension of justice. Another thing I wanted to, but we don't have time is the whole work of Yuval Noah Harari, both Homo Deus and Sapiens, also the 21 lessons for 21st century. They really respond to Rawls' criticism and proves also that Rawls is right. 
Harari says very clearly, even concepts like money and nation, they are imaginary concepts which we human beings share. Just like Karl Marx spoke about money and God are imaginary concepts that we human beings share and we are ready to die for our belief. Okay, this will take us too much to our, from our discussion. Therefore, let me come to the final part. During this pandemic, and when Rawls wrote his book, A Theory of Justice, it was immediately after the World War and the world was in disarray, just like ours today. When society is already divided into those with and without power, when we cannot really appreciate the procedural difficulties, can we still believe in hope, goodness of human beings, especially of fellow human beings? And within this context, John Rawls, John Rawls has made an outstanding contribution, which is not just impressive and insightful, which will also lead to greater democracy, liberal humanism, and freedom of individuals. We still need to dialogue like Habermas would say. We need to base reason as the foundation for human dialogue and collaboration. And then we can seek justice, goodness, fairness collectively. But then, coming to meaning of sin and faith, what is meaning given the situation of so much of injustice being done to fellow human beings? What is the meaning of human being, our life, the meaning of our existence? And much more, what about sin, the selfishness, the greed? You know, as legal experts, you know, how greed, violence, plays so much of a role in the relationship between the victim and the villain. And this has to be taken seriously. Of course, Rawls tried initially, but then in the world, in the actual world where there is so much of sin, we need to be much more attentive. Faith. If you are a believer in God, of course, we can talk about faith in God, but forget that faith in God, but what about the faith in our fellow human beings? The faith in our companions and colleagues that fosters goodness, trust, and will be. Therefore, the early roles, his emphasis on meaning, sinfulness, selfishness, and faith, we still need to rediscover so that we can recognize the self-worth, dignity, respect, the equity and fairness of each individual, even the poorest, the lowest, the Dalits, and the disadvantaged. And we can still raise the same question along with Rawls and Karl Marx. Has money become our God today? The capitalistic society and how alienated are we from ourselves? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Guru. Uh, maybe before anybody asks a question, I like to remind about a little uh, chat controversy that was happening while you were speaking. Uh, that was about the uh, uh, role of money in Jewish society. So, uh, uh, whether Marx's interpretation is close to uh, Nazi's interpretation of Jewish society and uh, uh, a rebuttal on that, that is a misunderstanding. Maybe you could uh, respond to that before we move on to anybody else asking any other questions. Okay, I also saw some, some comments. Let me just uh, briefly say it. There are some critics who understands Marx that uh, 
Jewish question as a racist or anti-Semitic agenda. But you should very clearly know, Marx himself was a Jew. Although he didn't believe in the Jewish religious tradition, he was proud of the Jewish ethnic tradition. And when he said that we are going to liberate Judaism from the Jewish God, he was actually talking about empowering the whole humanity. Empowering the whole humanity by, this is Marx's own words, if I remember well, by not by freeing the Jews from the God that is their money. So Marx with his you know, unique criticism of capitalism and money, money is God, was trying to empower human beings by freeing us from our own alienation. It is true, some people have used this argument of Karl Marx to, uh, to promote their anti-Semitic and racist mentality, including Hitler, including Hitler. Now for that matter, let me bring in another philosopher, all of you are heard of Frederick Nietzsche. Nietzsche with his super, superhuman being, the superman, he has also been used by Hitler and co to subjugate the Jews and also against the underprivileged. And still more, a third philosopher, Martin Heidegger, he lived just uh, two or 20 years ago. He has also been used by the German uh, Nazis to really fight against the Jewish heritage. Okay, in this connection, uh, one thing we must admit, most of the philosophers were one Germans, two of Jewish origin. Most of them, not all of them. And the Jews had a special propensity to be intellectually sharp. One study by the num study of the number of Nobel Prizes received, so many Jews were part of it. But then at the same time, a Jew will not belittle another, his tradition, although he does not believe in the Jewish God. And aside, one thinker told me, one professor actually told me, the three of the greatest people who changed dramatically the human history. They were all from Jewish religion. One, Karl Marx. Second, Jesus. Third, Moses. So in a way, these three figures are symbolic. Moses, Jesus, and Marx. Both were Jews, but to various degrees. But they have contributed substantially to the thinking, to the growth process of we as human beings. Therefore, Karl Marx would be very upset if we say that he would be a racist or he is anti-Judaic. Thank you, Guru. Satvik, please go ahead, ask. You are, you are on mute. And thank you, Professor, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question. It's like asking you to look at a magic uh, sphere and uh, try to understand how it will look like in future. So uh, my question comes from the understanding that our um, definition, realization of ideas such as sin, virtue, morality, thinking gods, even the gods themselves, they have changed over time. So uh, in our 80,000, 120,000 of uh, thousand years of our existence, our gods have changed, ideas of these things have also changed. So now, Rao, apparently from your uh, presentation, it seems Rawls had some religious influence. It's not totally influenced by it, but 
it gave him some impetus. So my question is, how would a uh, future generation will uh, look at Rawls' theory of justice when maybe there would be other ideas instead of rights uh, or equality or some other thing? Just like looking at the magic ball. Thank you, Satvik, for the question. It is a very interesting one. After 50 years, now we reflect on Rawls. After 500 years, what could be their response? Uh, let me just refer to the, our friend uh, Harari. I, I refer to Harari. You know, he has got the book, Sapiens, of course, is the grand history of human beings. The other book is Homo, Homo Deus. His basic insight is, we created history. We created, human beings created history when we invented God. So right from the beginning, when we invented God, we have a tradition and we became aware, aware of our own identity and we created history. Now we are at the turning point. Now we ourselves are becoming gods. We are becoming gods by our tremendous technological power, by the artificial intelligence we have at our disposal, and we can create life, eliminate life. You know, in all traditions, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, two of the unique divine characteristics is one, bringing forth new lives, two, eliminating life, that is death. So Harari would say, we are becoming gods. And worse, this is the worst pro problem with Harari. I mean, I, I may agree with the, his basic insight. He would say, even our cherished ideas like justice, fairness, dignity, they all will dis disappear. Because when the supercomputers, when the AI takes over from us, what we consider so precious to us, justice, fairness, humanism, democracy, they will all be absorbed or they will disappear because what matters will be only comfort, security. And, and this is again to frighten you. They would say, many scientists are claiming that we may be able to overcome death too. So if we can overcome death also, then we have we truly become God. Then all our concept of equality becomes redundant. Our concept of caring for the others, compassion for the weak, they become totally, totally obsolete. Therefore, I hope, I wish that Harari will not be right. But Harari himself says he is not really looking at and hoping for this future, but he's only studying the progress of humanity from the 2 million years to the next 500 years. Okay, in this connection, if Harari is right, in the next 500 years, human beings would have realized that new stage of so-called human beings as gods, then justice as fairness, would have lost its significance. But I really wish that we remain human beings with our tenderness, with our weakness, with our stupidities, and with our frailties. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have probably another five minutes. Uh, I don't see any hands, so let me use the opportunity to ask uh, one question. That is the distinction in the Rawlsian approach and the Ricker. Ricker emphasized on the conflict while uh, uh, Rawls imagined a good institution can be built through a contractual approach. But in countries like our India, where we see conflict as innately linked to the identity question, uh, where do we see? Like, you know, it is not in the sense of a creating an institution, but it is it's innately linked to our identities. So, is Rawlsian approach of imagining a, a perfect society through a contractual consensus approach 
a workable one or is it a recur uh, route? But recur also takes the route of the virtue and good, uh, where uh, uh, Rawls is not prom prominently bringing, though he talks about it, it is not in the sense of Aristotelian virtue he's talking about. So uh, I, I have that confusion on which side to take or where do we strike a balance? See, the simplest answer I would say is, uh, let's use the, the, the category of means and the goal. We need a goal. And uh, Einstein would say, imagination is more important than anything else. See, that goal, that ideal, that utopia, whether it be the classless society, whether it be the Ram Rajya, or whether, whether it be roles, justice, as fairness, we need that. Human beings need that as a mirror, as something to aspire for. Okay, having have, we need to have that goal, that idea, that vision. But in actual life, you know, it is very, very difficult to reach that level because there are necessary inevitable conflicts. That is where Ricker would come in. Ordinary life, our day-to-day, -day, even as staff and students, you know, the tension that we experience among ourselves in the best institutions of the world, among ourselves and between ourselves. Therefore, I would say, we are not in an ideal world, but we need to have that ideal as the goal. But in the real world that we live in, the roughness of reality, that is where we face this kind of tension. You know, the tension between the rape of a woman and the, the ideal nobility we associate with the feminine, the violence, especially the violence given to the children. Now tell me what on earth or how on earth can we justify the death of a three-year-old child? Under no circumstances can we justify that. But we have to live with the, in such a world. We are experiencing that every day. And the corona situation makes it still more acute. Therefore, I would say the Ram Rajya, the ideal world, the utopia of Thomas More, all human beings, all of us need it. But we also know utopia is a utopia. We will never be able to achieve it. But without the utopia, we wouldn't be able to move forward. And that moving forward is the hardest part. For that, we need to realize the dialectic okay, of Karl Marx or even the Hegelian thesis, antithesis that would be beneficial to us. We we'll take one more question before we close. Uh, there uh, is one question by one doctor. Girish. He also has his hand up, so we'll ask him to ask the question rather than. Uh, Girish, please go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, myself, Dr. Girish Kumar from Central University of Kerala. Actually, it's about uh, the justice in the eye of the state as well as in the eye of the people, the difference between justice in the eye of the state as well as in the eye of the people, especially in situations like pandemic times, there are people who are forced to sit indoor. The liberty, the movement, everything is cut out. So, but the state is having the justification that it is for the good of all. Everyone is equally equally asked to sit indoor. The, curtail, the liberty of everyone is curtailed, so people should bear with it. But the effect of this, on the rich or the affluent is only, only nominal. They can sit indoor and they can simply criticize the government action in the social media. But the, on the other side, the poor people uh, who, who are daily wagers or like people, their um, right to livelihood is directly related to their um, freedom of movement. So in this kind of a situation, one side, the government is justified for its action because it is applicable for all to contain the pandemic situation. The other side, the effect created by that justified act is gross injustice to one section and uh, uh, nominal injustice to another section. In uh, How can we draw a clear line uh, between justice and injustice in this type of a situation? That was my query. Actually, it is... Uh, uh, supplemental uh, view from my side. 
I need uh, request the reflection of Kurula sir on that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jirish. My immediate response is, especially in the Indian context, especially in the Indian context, we live a terribly exploitative, terribly paradoxical situation. This is unimaginable in the Indian context. I mean, I, uh, I mean, I don't know. See, uh, very simple thing. Most of the professors earn something like one lakh rupees while a daily wage earner. Uh, they earn something like 500, 600 or uh, 10,000 rupees and they have no way. See, let us look, look at the European society, especially the Scandinavian society, where there is some disparity between income. But most people, they don't have to worry about going to hospital because their medical needs are taken care of by the government. Also, they have their own worries, but they don't have any worry about food, cloth, and shelter. Therefore, our society currently is an utterly unjust society that I'm talking about India. And to some extent, the American society is also like that, but at a different level. Now, the question that Rawls or Ricker would ask, can we, that is the Indians together, come together and make a society that is better for each one? There will still be some kind of disparity, some kind of inequality, which is unavoidable. But why should you have someone earning 10,000 rupees and another fellow just sitting there making crores of rupees practically doing nothing? He plays with the share market. He doesn't even play with the share market. He has got employees who will be, share, who will be playing in the share market and making millions while the poor men in the working in the field or the daily wage, wage earner will have, a, will have a totally different idea of justice. So I agree with you totally. But then we have to realize that we are living, especially in India, in a not just unjust, in a drastically unjust and inhuman world. And now again, you are from you are from Kerala, so you are not even aware of the worst calamities that is happening in North India. The ordinary people, how many of them are just shot, killed? And there is absolutely no account of that. Uh, when we look at all these tragedies and calamities, it's very painful. But the answer we we'll have to find as intellectuals searching together with, as I said, respect for each one's human dignity, equity, and fairness to all. This is an ideal. But in India, things are very, very bad. But we still cannot give up hope. We have to walk this way through. Painful, but we still have to walk this way. I think with that, we should uh, uh, close. Uh, let me thank all the speakers, all the participants, as well as Professor Kirivila, for this very exciting and lecture. We have next lecture coming on roles and feminism by Ruth Abbey, that is on 10th of July. So we will. See you all later after a month. Thank you very much. So thank you very, very much for your responses, for being with us. I really, really enjoyed my sharing. Thank you very much.